So before I tell you where to turn, lest you give me an answer to the question that I'm going to pose to you, <clears throat> here's the question I'm going to ask you. And, and you can answer. What would you say is the most impactful or influential church, local church, in the New Testament that we read of or that we hear of? Oh, come on. <laughs> that, that, that is the one that I'm actually going to talk about. So I was hoping that you would give me some other answers. <clears throat> yes, Antioch. I, I, well, I, I, would, I don't know that that's the case, by the way. I'm, I'm going to try to make the case. Uh, but uh, I don't think that there is a definite answer, by the way. I'm not dogmatic. But, I mean, I, I was expecting someone to say maybe uh, uh, you know, Ephesus, you know, the Ephesians. Paul writes to the Ephesians, and he writes some lofty doctrine, doesn't he? I mean, have you ever read the epistle to the Ephesians? It's like he reveals things to them. And then we read in, uh, in uh, Revelation about them, and in Acts about them. Uh, Ephesians is all over the Bible. So maybe, you know, you would have thought that that's a very influential church. Or perhaps the very, very zealous Corinthian church. I mean, that's an influential church. They lacked in no spiritual, they came behind in no spiritual gift, Paul says. Can you imagine? I mean, they had lots of problems, don't get me wrong. But they had so much going for them. And they were just zealous for the, you know, they wanted to get the gospel out there. And uh, lots of things were happening. They wanted spiritual gifts. They were praying for that kind of stuff. So that was, uh, that's an, probably a very influential church in church history. Um, perhaps uh, uh, someone would say, well, no, it was the Philadelphian church because of the fact that we read about the Philadelphian church in one of those short epistles that the Lord Jesus writes to the church, seven churches in Revelation. And uh, there's nothing wrong with the Philadelphian church. I mean, there's, there's no rebuke. And so maybe that's a very influential church. Or the famous church in Rome, out of all places, the capital of the ancient world, God had his people there, and that very, you know, important geographical position, I mean, that surely was an influential church. Or you would go all the way back and say, it all started in Jerusalem. That's where the apostles were. That's where the original Christians were. And so there, that must be the most influential church. And I don't think you would be wrong if you said any of those things, by the way. But Joe spoiled it all for us now by just saying Antioch. And I'm going to try to make the case that Antioch was actually a very, very important church, even though we don't have an epistle to Antioch, you know, in our Bibles. And we don't know that much about it, uh, as much as some other churches, maybe. <clears throat> we know fairly uh, a, good enough, a, good, a good amount of stuff. Um, so, Antioch. Well, Antioch was a place in Syria back then, because there's another Antioch, which is in a different location, but Antioch in Syria, today it's modern-day Turkey, right down there at the south of modern-day Turkey, right at the border with Syria, modern-day Syria. But back then, it was the third largest city of uh, the Roman Empire. In fact, it was the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire at the time. And so it was a very, very important city. Uh, again, a trade route and all sorts of stuff. It was a crossroad between north and south, east and west, and uh, lots of trading, lots of immorality, as you can imagine, everything going on. And, uh, and that's the kind of city where God likes to plant a church, you know. And so um, that's, uh, that's the church that we're going to be talking about. So turn with me to Acts uh, 11, and we'll read some, some verses in Acts of the Apostles. Uh, we'll begin in chapter 11. <clears throat> Uh, verse 19. <clears throat> now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia. Let, let me stop you there. Stephen was stoned to death in Jerusalem back in Acts 6 and 7. You can read about that. And uh, after his stoning, after they literally killed him, martyred him there, persecution uh, was spawned in all of Jerusalem, and that forced the Christians out of Jerusalem and into uh, the neighboring areas and uh, beyond. And so Luke, who writes Acts, tells us here, now, after those who were scattered after the persecution that arose after Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, 
preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. And that shouldn't surprise us, because that was the Jewish Messiah, it was a Jewish message, and they would have shared it with Jews and proselytes, people who were considered God-fearers in different places. You know, they, were, they had converted to Judaism, and now the next logical step was to tell them, let me tell you about the Jewish Messiah now. So why tell it to absolute Gentiles who have not got a clue about who Moses was or who the, what the law was? I mean, you know, we want to tell the Jews only. Now, it's, it made sense to them. But here in Antioch, look at what happens. But some, some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, which was in Lib- Libya, who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, which is the Greeks, preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great multitude believed and turned to the Lord. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he had come he had s- and seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And Saul here is Paul the Apostle. And when when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for, the, for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And in these days prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. <clears throat> Then the disciples, each according, that's the disciples in Antioch, each according to their to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Okay, now the chapter ends and the next chapter tells us another episode of, of what's going on in Acts. It tells us about Peter thrown in prison and so on and so forth, but you come all the way to chapter 12. Verse 25, we resume what had happened there at Antioch, sending Paul and Barnabas away to Jerusalem with money, with funds, uh, for relieving the saints who are going to go in, um, uh, through a famine. And so, verse 25, we read, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Now, that's chapter 13. Now, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was also called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate, separate unto me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work of to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them away. Amen. I'll stop reading there. So, that's, I mean, we we read about the church in Antioch a little bit further down again, but roughly that's most of the things that we know about Antioch and the church in Antioch in the Bible. And so, I thought I'd bring you, and I've brought a message like that in a Bible study maybe two years ago or something, and it was, I just have, I've expanded on it, and uh, it's, I hope it's, uh, some of that was going to be fresh and new to you and helpful. So, I've got a, a few points here about the church in Antioch that I think are absolutely vital. See, we are, we are a local church here, and, and I preach the same message to the church there in Autumn Park. Why? Because they're a local church, and we don't, I don't go there assuming that, well, they, in Alton Park, they do things differently, okay? They, 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 must have, they must have their own local customs of doing church. And then I go to Bulgaria, and I, 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 I assume that they have, you know, other customs there of doing church. Then I come here, and, well, maybe you have your own customs of doing church, and maybe go to Africa or Asia, and, well, maybe they have their own ways of doing church. No, we go back to the original, 
Well, we go, well, go back to the scriptures. We go back to what God had, has laid out for us, and that's how we know what local churches in every place ought to be like, and mind you, in every age. So we, churches don't change with the times. They stay anchored to the scriptures. That's how they remain faithful. And the reason I'm emphasizing the church in Antioch as a great example so much is because without the church in Antioch, you wouldn't have half of your New Testament. Did you realize that? I mean, you think about it. Of course, God uses means, and you know, providentially, He has just caused it that the church in Antioch would receive Paul, who was rejected by the church in Jerusalem earlier because they didn't trust him, and uh, they would receive him. They would be preaching to Gentiles, and those Gentiles would be converted, and, uh, and then they would be sensitive enough to hear God's voice in calling them out to go and preach to more Gentiles even elsewhere. And uh, during those missionary journeys, uh, the one that we read just now here in chapter 13, that's the start of it. During those missionary journeys, churches were planted. And what happened? Paul wanted to encourage them, wanted to straighten them out. And basically, he wrote letters to them. And some of those letters became your New Testament. So that's what the church has been, the, sh the Lord's sheep have been feeding on throughout the last 2,000 years. So quite important, that church in Antioch. Quite influential if you, if you have the right mindset, the right perspective. Maybe it wasn't a mega church. Maybe it didn't have a lot of money. Maybe it wasn't right there, you know, with uh, lots of, I don't know, fancy cars or whatever in front. You know what I mean? It, maybe it wasn't a, a church to write home about, but there you have it. It actually, in God's providence, was used mightily throughout church history. And so, here are nine points I have uh, on why we need to be more like the church in Antioch and what the church in Antioch had going for it. I mean, what, what was good about it? So the very first thing that we see straight off the bat as we began reading is that it is an evangelistic church, okay? Evangelistic church. I mean, here they are, those scattered abroad. They are preaching to no one but the Jews only. And, uh, and, and you know what? Some of them decide, well, no, we're going to, this message is too great to keep to ourselves or to the Jews only. And maybe the Jews only were rejecting it. You know what? We're going to, why don't we just go and tell the good news to all those Gentiles there, all those Greeks? They're, they're worshiping Zeus or whatever. I mean, they have no clue about Moses, but we're going to tell them about Jesus now and how Jesus is greater than Zeus. And, uh, and they go there and they, you know, venture out with, with faith and they preach the gospel to them. And guess what happens? God saves them. He uses that message to save them. And, uh, and, and that's how the church began. It began, the very conception of the church was evangelistic in nature. It wasn't a marketing strategy. Like, I've heard of churches, in fact, back home, someone was telling me in Bulgaria that, you know, some of the very wealthy, charismatic churches which are sponsored by the West, the, the way they do things is they go to a village, they build the church building first, and then they start, you know, giving out flyers in, in, the, in the village that they are going to give out free meals. And, uh, and so they get people from the village in so that they can receive a free meal. And by the way, they throw some, some Bible at them or whatever. And, and it's like, you know, trying to, trying to create a church like that. That's not the biblical way of creating a church. Creating a church is done through evangelism. When people get saved regardless of whether you have a building or not. There's not a single church building in the New Testament, by the way. So, you're in good company. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, they, they just started preaching to the whosoever, okay? And God blessed that. And, uh, and I say that, and I wanted to say that in Auden Park and anywhere else that I might use that message because, especially reform circles. You know what reform circles are? They, they're like, they, they like to think that well, we, we're considered perhaps in part of the reform circle, but anyway, they, people in the reform circle like to think that they have the, the highest, loftiest doctrine, right? And that we get everything, you know, everything right. And if God is at work anywhere in the world, he will be at work in the reform circles. And then you hear about some uh, church down the road who has no clue about the doctrines of grace, but they are evangelistic. And God uses their evangelism. You know why? Because they love the Lord and they are zealous for His truth and for the gospel and they just want to go and tell other people about Jesus. 
And God uses that. <laughs> and you have nothing to do about it. And, and you know, that's, that's, uh, that's how God does it. He humbles Reformed people like that. And uh, may we not be among those who are very, you know, high-minded, thinking we've got so much doctrine that we kind of like, well, you don't need to go and evangelize or whatever. No, don't become a hyper-Calvinist or something. <clears throat> one person, I heard one person say that uh, the gospel is not about getting people in. It's about getting the gospel out. I mean, that's what evangelism is. It's not about getting people into the church building. It's about getting the gospel out there, regardless of whether those people will end up in your church building or not. And I'm very thankful that there's, there's a dedicated group of people here uh, who go out on a weekly basis and more that even pray for them uh, because not expecting that everyone who they talk to has to come here and not getting disappointed when people don't come here all the time because of their evangelistic efforts. That's a good sign. I am happy about that. I'm happy for some of those students that we spoke with there with Joe uh, on Freshers' Fair, on the Freshers' Week. I'm happy if some of them, because of something we said, if they end up going to, I don't know, one of those other churches down in town. That's good. I mean, uh, as long as they're good and healthy churches, that's good. The, the, the kingdom is growing. Have a bird's eye view. This is not it. This is not all of it. This is not Christendom here, okay? God has his people in other parts of Manchester too and other parts of the world. And what a blessing it is to be able to be used like that even if you don't get credit for it. I mean, look at what, look at the guy, Barnabas. Well, he, he went to this place, Antioch, he saw the grace of God there, what had happened, and what does it say? Was he jealous? Was he upset? No, he was glad. God give us more Barnabases like that who are glad when they have nothing to do with the work that they see. And they're and still happy that God has, God has been at work there. Isn't that the attitude that you want to have? So anyway, this is, the, this is what the church was like. It was evangelistic. And you might say, well, okay, this is a bit, this is a bit uh, ridiculous that they were preaching to the Jews only. I mean, of course that shouldn't be the case. Um, now we are evangelistic because we preach both to Jews and Gentiles, right? Well, let me, let me tell you this. They had their prejudices, and so do we. So can we. I mean, I, I want you to be very careful not to have prejudices in your own hearts about evangelism. We go out in town, and out in town is full with homosexuals and LGBT kind of people from the youngest of ages to the oldest of ages. And uh, do you, I mean, do you catch yourself thinking, what's the point? I mean, God has given them over to a reprobate mind, right? I mean, that's what Romans 1 seems to suggest. So, you know, that's, that's God's judgment on them. No, no point in sharing the good news with them. Really? 1 Corinthians 6 says that such were some of the Corinthians. So, so God is not Stop, stop saving homosexuals. He can say, well, God, give us some former homosexuals here. God, give us some you know, former Jews and former Muslims. Isn't that what we pray for? Do you think, do, or do you start thinking, oh, what's the point in, in talking to Muslims? You know, they're so brainwashed, hard-headed with their Islam, you know, radical Islam. They don't receive the Trinity. They don't understand the deity of Christ. They, they take offense at the infallibility of Scripture. What's the point? I mean, you're just wasting your time with them. That's another prejudice. I mean, some of them are undoubtedly time wasters. Be vigilant. But at the same time, that doesn't mean you stop preaching the gospel to them. No. They need the gospel as much as you did. And so, and so you, you preach the gospel to Muslims or to the prison, the prison work. Some of the brethren here are involved in a prison work. And, and glory to God for that. I'm happy for that. I mean, but do you, I want you all to be able to pray for that. I want you all to be able to pray without prejudice, without thinking, ah, yeah, you know, those guys in prison, they, you know, they, they're too far gone, are criminals, you know, they... Listen, there but for the grace of God go I and you. So if the grace of God has reached you, you're just as wretch wretched as they are. I mean, yes, maybe you didn't do some things on the, on the outside um, as bad as them, but you need God's grace as much as they do, and, uh, and so come without prejudice. Let us be an evangelistic church. Let us actually you know, continue being an evangelistic church and, uh, and not just rest on our laurels and think, well, yeah, we've given out X amount of tracts last year, so you know, that's good enough. No, we, we continue preaching to the Hellenists, okay, to those who are on the outside. Because let me tell you, if we don't, 
God will raise up someone else who will. You know, if it's not the original Jews and the apostles who got saved initially, God raised up some, you know, some guys from Cyprus and some guys from Cyrene, and he said, you know what, you go preach to the Greeks. And you know what, they heard the gospel and got saved. So let us be the, the Cyrenians, let us be the Cy Cypriots, okay, who God uses to bring even those on the outside to himself. And by the way, God knows how to make a church evangelistic. Did you catch what happened here? It was after the persecution that, that arose after the death of Stephen, after Stephen got killed. There was persecution. You know what happened? God, well, Christ said to his disciples, now you'll be witnesses to me where? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, at the ends of the earth, right? And do you know what happened? They were witnesses to him in Jerusalem only, pretty much, until the persecution came. And then the persecution kind of kicked them in the rear end and, you know, they actually started going out. And, and sometimes God uses that kind of thing. And he strips you of everything you think you have in this world, whether comfort, whatever. And he strips you from all that so that you are left with none but Christ alone. And when you have nothing to lose, you become more evangelistic, you know? And so, who knows, maybe the Lord will do something like that, but let us be evangelistic anyway, okay? Let us be evangelistic even before the persecution comes, because he knows how to make us such. Well, that's the first thing. They, they were an evangelistic church. Now, the second point I have here is that they were, brace yourselves, because I don't like the word that I'm going to use, they were a multicultural church, okay? Multi-ethnic church. Let's, put, let's call it a united church. Now, the reason I don't like multi, you know, to use that kind of language is because there are some globalists out there in the world who use multiculturalism as an excuse to, you know, just for communism, basically, okay? That's not what I'm saying, okay? That's not what was happening here. It was simply that in their church, they had... Uh, a, it was a sample of their society. You know, it wasn't just a church for old people or just a church for young people or just a church for white or black or whatever, you know, kind of people. You know, it was a church for those who believed in Jesus. And that's what the church is ever, always meant to be, okay? It, it's not meant to segregate itself and divide itself in all those different, in, you know, identities. A church for, you know, men and the church for women and the church for little children and the church for this and that and the other, okay? The church for the rich and the church for the poor. Away with that thinking. That's not biblical Christianity. That's, that's not what, what the church was supposed to do and be. It, the gospel, it doesn't just save people from every culture and every tribe and every kindred and every nation and every ethnicity. It unites people from every culture and tribe and nation and ethnicity, okay? It, that's, a, that's a very important distinction. You can believe in your mind, oh yeah, God is absolutely able to save. I mean, okay, I, I don't know what exactly what the, usually the prejudices are here and the ethnic tensions are in this country. I mean, I, I kind of have a, an idea now, but I'll tell you about back home, okay? Back home, uh, Bulgarians and Turks, okay? Bul Turkish people. Yeah, they, they've had long history of, of fighting, of this, that, and the other. And uh, in some places, people do, they don't like each other very much, okay? And what the gospel can do, I mean, we were 500 years under the Ottoman Empire. We call it Ottoman slavery. And, uh, and so uh, here's what, what, what happens. The gospel, you can, some, some believers might be like, yeah, yeah, we believe that the gospel can save Turkish people as well, as well as Bulgarian people. Oh, but we'll never be the same church. That's wrong. Okay? The gospel not only saves Turks and Bulgarians, but actually can bring them together in the same church. And they can worship the same Lord Jesus together in spirit and in truth. I don't know what the equivalent of that is here in this country, but it, it applies here as well. You know, that God uses the gospel to make former enemies beat their swords into plowing shares and work, have them work together. That's what gospel does. And so, you know, that again, I say this can be here in theory and you can believe it in your mind. And then in practice, you can actually get it wrong. 
You know what happened in Antioch? Peter was there. And Peter was happy, you know, he was eating with the Gentile believers and everything was fine. And then a few guys came from his, you know, Jewish buddies. And, uh, and he started eating with them and siding with them and kind of like, you know, separating from the, from the Gentile believers. I can't really eat with you now anymore, can I? Well, Paul saw that as a, a rank hypocrisy and he called it out publicly and he said, Peter, how dare you? What are you doing? You are not living according to the truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel. You say that the gospel has brought you together, both you and those Gentiles together, and you are one in Christ. It has divided, or sorry, it has broken down, down that wall of separation, of division. It has broken it down. So what are you doing dividing? What are you doing building the wall up again? And so Peter, by God's grace, repented of that, and everything was fine. You know, but, but that just goes to show that if Peter can be like that, we can be like that. So watch out, because sometimes it can be a or it, it can be a multicultural church where all sorts of different cultures and backgrounds. And by the way, this is very much like this one. But and, and we all come together and we all sing together and we all listen to the sermon together. But then there's there's kind of cliques and factions and you know different things that happen. You know you know just people kind of uh, seem to want to just fellowship with a certain group of people. Just watch out for that. I'm not saying that I'm seeing that. I'm just saying that watch out for it. It's in our hearts to do that kind of stuff. So watch for it. Because the gospel says, no, there's no division now. And you're all one in Christ. And that's not true in, in, in reality. You know, when you are truly saved, all of a sudden you can meet someone with whom you have absolutely no common interests. In fact, that person can be 70 years older than you and uh, has lived, lived a different life on a different continent, in a different background, different interests, different everything, and now all of a sudden you have everything in common with that person and you love that person. Why? Because God has done something in his heart or in, in your heart. And now all of a sudden you're, you're, the bond of love works there together. And, and you, you can have more things in common with that person and more love for that person than you can have for a natural friend with whom you've grown up and lived for the last 30 years or whatever. So that's how the gospel works. But watch out for it. Watch out for that kind of sectarianism and, and that kind of uh, divisionism. You know, what right there? I don't know if there's a word like that, but you know. see what Paul says in Galatians 3. He says, and by the way, that's, Galatians 2 is where he tells you about Peter and what happened with Peter in Antioch. In Galatians 3, he says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, but for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Your access to God through Christ does not depend on your ethnicity, on your status, you know, social status, how rich or how poor you are, or your gender. Your access to God in Christ is the same. And here is where your identity, brethren, ought to be. It is, if you are in Christ, it is Christ. Now, does that mean that you stop being British or Bulgarian or some other? No, of course not. You still have your passport. You still have your, you know, ethnic traits and whatever. And, and by all means, keep them. And that, no, there's nothing wrong with that. But that's far down the line. That's secondary. That, that's far down. You know, those, even your cultural traits or ethnic traits, they are not going to disappear even in heaven. Have you read Revelation where it says that out of people out of all, every tribe, nation, and kindred, they are gathered there before that throne? And, uh, and it seems like that, that, those differences, that diversity is redeemed and is there in all its beauty, in all its color, in all in everything. You know, that's beautiful. That's what God has created in Christ from, from all sorts of different backgrounds and people. Good for nothing. He has created one new man. And that is what he has done. And we are to exemplify that and show that even here down below in the local church. And we don't show that by segregating rich, poor, black, white, all sorts of different divisions like that. We don't do that. We don't show anything. That we, what's Christ done? <laughs> what's Christ done? Yeah. So, brethren, let us be careful there. Because he has forever united those who are in Christ in one new man. That's what Jesus prayed, that they might be one, right? As we are one. 
He prayed to the Father. And do you know what? The Father heard his prayer and answered it. So that's, that's the second thing I have here. It's a multicultural kind of church, Antioch was. But it was also a generous church. Now, did you catch that? Uh, uh, prophets come down from Jerusalem, or come from, uh, from Jerusalem and tell them that there's going to be a famine in a coming day in Judea. And, uh, and guess what happens? Do you know what happens? Now, Antioch is 800 kilometers away from, um, uh, from uh, Jerusalem. That's not a great distance, okay? That'll take you about, I don't know, six, seven hours to drive maybe now these days. Obviously, back then it took longer to walk. But if there's a famine 800 kilometers away, you might feel it here. So the first thought of the carnal mind, do you know what it is? It's self-preservation. It's like, oh no, there might be a, a famine down there. Well, we better e equip ourselves here. We better stash up and, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, buy all the toilet paper as they did in, you know, COVID days or whatever. You know, that, that's how people think these days, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and instead of thinking about themselves, they thought about their brethren up down there in Jerusalem. And uh, the famine wasn't even there. And they didn't say, well, you know, that's just a prophecy. Let's see if it actually comes to pass. You know, who knows? If it actually comes to pass and we hear a word about it, then we'll send some relief. No, they trusted the word of God that came to them. And they said, listen, if there's going to be a famine coming, we better send the relief now. They acted in faith. You know what? If You, know, you couldn't just do a bank transfer like over, over your phone for one second. That 800 kilometers had to be trekked by someone with the money, and there's all sorts of things that could happen on the way, okay? And so they decided to send the money straight away by Paul and Barnabas, even though the famine wasn't even there yet. What a, can you imagine what an answer to prayer and to, you know, just what glorious uh, thing it would have been down there in Jerusalem when, you, when those needy saints realize that actually provisions are running out. There's a famine in the land. Oh no, what are we going to do? They set themselves to pray and the next thing they know, they, there's a knock on the door and lo and behold, God has moved his people elsewhere like a few weeks earlier to send the relief that has come right at the right moment in time. That's what, that's what God does, you see? And that's what you want to do when you hear God's word. You want to be sensitive. You want to listen to it so that you can actually act upon it, obey it, and be used by God. So they were, they were the generous people. The, the church in Antioch was very generous. Everyone, according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren in Judea. This was not a top-down. It wasn't the elders twisting their arms and saying, listen, now you've got to give for those saints in Jerusalem, okay? Because we've, we've told them they were going to... No, no, no. That was a spontaneous. That was a voluntary offering from the church. And that's how it should be with us, brethren, as well. You know, it's, it's voluntary. We want to we wanna help those missionaries out there that we are, we're praying about and we're, we've committed to things, but it's got to be voluntary. It's got to be from the heart. That's why, you know, stir your hearts with that kind of, with, with prayer for them, and uh, the generosity will come. <clears throat> so, they send Paul and Barnabas, and... Uh, they, they send them to the elders. Obviously, there's an order here. They, they, they know that the elders would know best how to distribute the funds down there. And you know what the irony is? The irony is that perhaps Paul went to the church where they didn't receive him, uh, and some of the believers are there, and he came there with money and with help from the people in Antioch, from the brethren in Antioch. Because you know how in the beginning when he got saved, the, the, the brethren in Jerusalem, they didn't want to have anything to do with him because they were afraid of him. He was this... this very intimidating persecutor, former persecutor of the church. But the irony, and God does things like that, doesn't he? He, he uses someone like that to now go to them and actually give them funds. And, and you know what? That humbles people like that. <clears throat> so, and there we have it. They were a generous church. And they, they were not just generous with their money, though, brethren. They were generous with their with their people as well. Did you catch what happened there? Two of their best, most gifted men were sent out to the mission field. Paul and Barnabas. The Lord said by His Spirit, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work that I have called them to. 
And you know what? They were not like, well, no, we need them here. Sorry, go find somewhere, someone else. No, we need. They said, they said, well, if if you need them, they're, they're going. And you know what? They sent them away. The most gifted of the men, and because of that sacrifice, a great deal of good was done. And the church in Antioch, as a result, was involved in some of the greatest missionary efforts throughout church history. Isn't that amazing? And so there's, there you have it, a generous church, an evangelistic church, a multicultural church, but also a risk-taking church. Now, I go back to my message a few weeks ago about faith and how faith always takes risks and all of that. And just think for a moment some of the risks that that church took. I mean, first of all, in evangelizing Gentile, absolute, you know, you know, Gentiles, <laughs> heathens, that, that, that's to say. They had no exposure to the law of God, and they took the risk to go out there and tell them about the Jesus, who's the Jewish Messiah and the Lord of all, and uh, God used that. They took a risk. They took a risk when Barnabas went down and found Saul, Saul that no one wanted, remember? The persecutor. And uh, he brought them to he brought him to them, and uh, the church embraced him and said, "Listen, if you're going to teach us the Bible, go for it. <laughs> teach us the Bible. You, you know." And uh, and they loved that. And uh, so so what else? They sent financial help through him to a distant land, and they you know imagine that. They imagine collecting all your money there, and then going away for weeks on end without knowing. I mean, this, this Saul, I mean, yes, uh, we, we, we trusted him. He, he was here for a year. He taught us and everything. But now, has he disappeared with our money? It, are the money going to get to where they were supposed to go? So they took a risk. It takes risks, brethren. Faith takes risks. And then they returned with John Mark from Jerusalem as a, a, as a witness of the receipt of the money. Right? Someone who can testify from there. Yes, we got the money, and uh, we are very thankful for it. And then they used John Mark for their first missionary journey. Remember that? And that was a disappointment. And sometimes you take risks, and there was going to be a disappointment. And that's fine. The only one who doesn't fail is the one who doesn't try. And so here they are. They try things. They are, they are a church that takes risks. They are responding to the prompting of the Spirit. Send two of your best men out there. Well, uh, how long are they going to be out there for? I mean, uh, are they going to, where are they going to go? What are they going to eat? I mean, wh what are we going to do? Uh, yeah, lots of questions, lots of unknowns. And yet, they took the risk. They were obedient to the Lord's voice. The, Lord, the Holy Spirit didn't tell them, separate unto me, Paul and Barnabas, and I'll tell you exactly their itinerary, everywhere they'll go, everywhere they'll stay, exactly when they're going to be back. No, he just said, separate unto me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work I have for them, and send them out. Trust me, risk. What if? What if they don't come back? What if they get killed? Who's going to teach us? Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? I mean, isn't that a waste? Who's got lots of questions, brethren? And yet, faith takes risks. And I tried to bring that message into the message a few weeks ago when I was telling you about Moses there at the at, at the edge of the Red Sea and and all the Israelites with him, and the armies behind him, you know, Pharaoh's army wanting to slaughter him alive. And, uh, and, and at that point, the Israelites turn on him, and they, they're like, well, was there no graves in Egypt that you brought us here to die? And he says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He says that in faith, brethren, because he didn't know what God would do. He didn't know that the sea would be split in two. And that's what it does. It takes risks. He doesn't insure himself about everything. You know, overly cautious, overly pragmatic about everything. So this was a risk-taking church. Not just risk-taking for the sake of risk-taking, but risk-taking in faith, uh, in God's word. It was also a church, my fifth point, which, was, which had a solid spiritual leadership. I mean, did you catch that in verse 1 of chapter 13? There was Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Manian, Saul, five guys. Now they are they are listed here as prophets and teachers, but they were really the elders, the leadership of the church. They are just described by their giftedness. 
And so, and so we know about Saul. He became so, uh, Paul the Apostle, of course. But Barnabas, you know, I already said a few words about him. Verse 22, he was glad to see the grace of God. He encouraged them with, that with the purpose of, same purpose of heart. They should continue with the Lord. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and with faith. And Barnabas, the name itself, it was a nickname given to him. I think his original name was Joseph. And uh, the, uh, the nickname meant son of encouragement. He was an encourager. That's why they called him that. And so, uh, you know, this guy was full of faith. And does it surprise you that this guy, if this guy was there, that the church was also full of faith? I mean, that, there's, a, there's a saying that goes, that a church never rises higher than the personal example and faith of its leaders. Now, that's not a Bible verse, okay? So take it with a pinch of salt. But there's something to it. And that's a great indictment on many church leaders. And that's a great... Um, well, challenge, let's put it that way, to myself. I mean, like, well, that example that church leaders give does matter. And personal holiness does matter. And a personal example and, and faith in the leaders does matter. And the, the church had, was full of faith as a result of Barnabas being there who was full of faith. Oh, brethren, those were not celebrity pastors, by the way. You know, yes, we know Paul and Barnabas, they were famous, but... Uh, at least to us, they're well known because they're in the Bible. But have you heard of, of those three other guys? Simeon, Lucius, Manian? What, what did they teach on? What, what was their style of preaching? When did they get saved? Where did they come from? I mean, like, the, none of that is clear in, in, this, in this passage. It doesn't say. They were not famous. They were just faithful. And that's what we need. Faithful leaders in the churches. We need faithful pastor teachers in any church. That's it's not by not elders are not judged by their fame, but by their faithfulness over what God has given them. And may God raise up more and more faithful men like that in this land. Now, there's a great dearth. May God keep those who are faithful, even. And then there was obviously the obvious thing that there was a plurality of them, right? There were five of them. At least. And, um, <clears throat> and, and, and there's a lot of reasons why that's a good thing. And that's, a, that's well, the, the Bible clearly, I mean, it's not a command that there should be always a plurality of elders. There's a period of time where certain churches were churches, yet they had no elders. But it is certainly a healthy thing for churches to have a plurality of elders. And that's why we pray for more elders here, right? I hope so. I hope you pray for that, even in your own time. Please do. Because we need that. And, and just on a practical level, I mean, they share the load of, of the, the ministerial responsibilities. They have accountability one to another. They, every truth then is confirmed by two or three witnesses. Uh, the, they complement one another. And that's the beauty of it. When you, see, you, know, when you have different preachers here every, every other week, uh, you know, it's not so that you pick and choose who you love best. No, the point is that they are all different. And uh, when they're, they're all different, they have a different emphasis and style and this, that, and the other. Why? Because God has done it so that he complements them so that you are act actually healthier than if it was just one guy. Because there's only so much gifts that, that, that one guy can have. But if there are more, then they can have multiple gifts, and then you receive then more, and as a result, you're better equipped for the work of the ministry. And then they even have a longer reach. Why? Because, you know, five guys can do more than one guy can. And, and when there are five guys, two of them can go out, you know, as opposed to if it was just one guy. So that's, uh, that's the biblical pattern. And that's what we pray for, plurality of elders. So they, were, they had a healthy and solid uh, leadership in that church. That's uh, what we see here. And they, the sixth point is that they were sensitive to the Spirit's voice. They were sensitive to the Spirit's voice. I mean... Chapter 13, verse 2 and 3. They ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Spirit said, how did he say that? Did he say it audibly? Did he say it by an impression that was laid upon the prophets among them? Did he say it by revealing it through the congregation somehow? Or through a need that was shared? Or through some... We don't, we're, we don't know. That's not shared with us. But what... What's told us is that the Holy Spirit did speak, and they were attentive to the Spirit's voice, okay? 
they were listening for the still small voice of the Spirit. And uh, when they heard that voice, whether audible or not, they checked against it. They weren't quick to rush into things, no. But then they, having fasted and prayed, making sure that there was a confirmation, this truly was the voice of the Spirit, they sent them away. They laid hands on them. This wasn't like, oh yeah, that's Paul and Barnabas' thing, you know, let them do their thing. No, the church was absolutely behind them in this. And you know what? Uh, when Paul and Barnabas left, the church remained thriving there. You know, the three other guys that you've never heard of, the Lord was using them. And so, you know, they had a, there was a healthy leadership. There was a spiritually sensitive leadership. And so that's what the result was. They were, they were a church which was used by the Lord. And then the seventh thing is that they were a praying and fasting church. Those same verses that we just read. I mean, praying, that's a, such an important brethren. I really encourage you. Let me take this moment now to encourage you. I, I, I cannot count you all here, okay? And I know that some of you are visitors. There's probably, I don't know, 70, 80 people here in the room counting with the children. Who knows? There's not that many people in the prayer meeting. And I know, I know that that's not always possible. And I know that some of our visitors here, I said all that. I don't want to uh, give all sorts of, but brethren, we want to be a praying church. And I'm very thankful. It has been encouraged that people generally just pray, come and show up to the meetings, uh, you know, to the prayer meetings and stuff. But let us not forsake, brethren, not just the, you know, the Sunday gathering, but the Wednesday gathering of the church when we come together to pray. That's the beating heart of the church. If anything good happens in the church, it is only to some degree because of the Sundays and because of the evangelism and everything, but it's a lot, it has a lot to do with what the prayers, ha what happens in the prayer meeting, okay? And so let us continue to be a church which is praying, just like this one in Antioch. And a, a study on prayer in, uh, in Acts is, is amazing to see how, you know, God always uses prayer to do something. I mean, he shows you in Acts. It's like he, he pulls the curtain, the, the veil back, and he shows you into the spiritual world. And he shows you that every time the church comes together to pray, things happen. Beyond just the answer to the prayer, things happen in the spiritual world. I mean, uh, Acts 4, there's like an earthquake that happens, okay? That's in the physical world. But nonetheless, things are happening when the church comes together to pray. Acts 7. Uh, Stephen prays and he sees the heavens open and Christ sat down or no standing there at his uh, beside his throne and uh, uh, Acts 9 Paul prays the converted Saul prays and he receives his vision back uh, Acts 10 Cornelius prays and an angel is sent to him uh, and again in Acts 10 uh, Peter prays and what happens he receives a vision to showing him that what God has cleansed he should not call unclean and Acts 12 Peter is in prison and the church prays and he miraculously is, is led out of the prison. Acts 13, the missionary work of the church begins and uh, the half of the New Testament churches that are mentioned in your New Testament are birthed as a result of that. Every time the church prays, things are happening. You know, might not always see it, but that's the case. I mean, Acts 16, they were praising God, they were praying, they were this, and, and what happened? Again, in prison, the an earthquake happens, they are set free. We need to be a praying church. We need to be a praying church. And they were not just a praying church, but a fasting church. That's praying on steroids, okay? That's when you're really desperate. And that's, I, I, I know all of you, you know, I, I didn't have to kind of convince you that fasting is important. I don't have to convince you that, that it's biblical because you all know that. We've all talked about it. We all do it to some degree or another. But, but Jesus says, when you fast, not if you fast. And, and we see examples like this one in Antioch that the church collectively fasted together. And that's something that we want to emulate. That's a good thing. Why? Because that's when they heard the Spirit's voice. They fasted and served the Lord with fasting like that. They were listening to the Lord's voice. So they were a praying and fasting church as well. My eighth point is that they were a mission-oriented church. Now you say, well, George, didn't you say that they are evangelistic? I mean, what's the difference? Well, the difference is in the scope, I suppose. The, the evangelism has to do with, you know, you trying to, you know, win people around you. And uh, that might be in private conversations in your everyday life, or it might be a, a joint effort from a few of you going into town and, or somewhere else, or in the neighborhood here. But that's evangelism. And 
mission, uh, missions is, is something that you don't, you, you won't see the benefit of here, okay? You send some men out and there's almost no, no um, you know, no, uh, um, any kind of uh, feedback that you'll get here. It's not like the, this church will be full be because uh, some missionaries have gone out in China from here, okay? It's, it's something that is even more selfless, okay? You, you're thinking of the church universal. You're looking at it from a bird's eye perspective. You're saying, yes, it's not just about GFM. There are other sheep out there that Christ has, that he has to bring in, and we want to be involved. And you want God to use you in that way. And so that's how mission-oriented they were. They were praying about it, they were fasting about it, and God sent them. Now, notice this. Before that, he chose those two men, he actually tested those two men. The one who's faithful in the little is faithful in the what? In the much. And so that's what happened here. They were faithful in the little. What was the little? They were sent to Jerusalem with money. That wasn't exactly a mission trip, exactly, you know. But they went there and they faithfully discharged that mission. They faithfully brought the money to the disciples there and they came back. That was a faithful mission complete, okay? And that prepared them for the task that was to follow. They were faithful in the little, and now God could entrust the mission that would birth most of the churches of the New Testament to them. And that's what we want to be, brethren. A mission-oriented church also. A church, you know, I've said that before, I think, but someone pointed it out to me, that when a church begins to look outside of itself, towards the corners of the earth, and... Uh, towards the completion of the Great Commission, it starts, or it stops noticing the little problems that are inside the church. The little problems that become big problems if you focus on them too much. You know, churches that are, that stop being mission-oriented and, you know, stop looking towards the ends of the earth with the gospel, they start looking towards each other too much. And they start seeing just different problems with each other. And those little problems that are just Pecky things become big things, and hair-splitting things, you know, armchair theologian kind of things, and, uh, and ends up in, a, in divisions, brethren. And do you know what, what is uh, always healthy? To have a church which looks outside towards the people and the places which have real problems. I'm not saying, I'm not, I know that some of you are going through difficulties, okay? But then you read some of those emails from certain places around the world which we receive here, um, and uh, you realize that your real problems and their real problems are on a very different, you know, they're on a very different spectrum, okay? And you realize, wow, there are people who are, it's life and death every day. It's like, you don't, you don't know, you woke up this morning, you don't know if you'll see the sunset. I mean, that kind of thing. And then you see that the work of God is done there. And you're like, okay, I want to be involved. I want to just pray for that place. I want to, I want to give more to that place. I want to do something. I want to go there. I want to, so that's mission oriented thing. Or orientedness and that's that's why that's healthy for the church here because it stops you it prevents you from starting to be too introspective on yourselves and on this church and being like kind of small issues I, I don't like how this brother you know shook my hand this morning because you know it was not firm enough and uh, maybe he's got a problem with it. you know that kind of things brethren we're in the midst of warfare okay Slap your faces around and just uh, wake up from that kind of playing church. I don't like that. I mean, I'm not saying that that's what's happening here. I'm saying that that's, I've seen that happen in places, and I don't like that. Yeah, we're, we're here just for a brief time. Let's not play church. Oh, they were, they were a, a mission-oriented church. And finally, they were a doctrinally sound church. First of all, when Barnabas came, they were. They embraced the teaching. They weren't. Um, you know, they weren't kind of like dismissive of it. No, they longed to be taught. In fact, so much so that Barnabas was like, "I, I can't do that by myself. Let me go fetch Saul, and we'll come here together because he's he's pretty a pretty good teacher." And so they came together and they taught the church for a year, and the church was lapping it up, and it was lo they were loving it. They were teachable, but they weren't gullible. Right? That's important. They weren't just believing anything anyone said. Because later on in chapter 15, we read that men came from Judea, that's verse 1, and uh, taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now what? Do they take this teaching in? No. Well, here's what happens. They 
then therefore when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with those guys they meaning the church in Antioch determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question see they were serious about doctrine it wasn't a small thing this they weren't just like well they said they should be circumcised let's might as well go go with that or yeah it doesn't really matter what they say I don't, don't really care we just do things our way here no we want to do the real thing does Jesus want us to get circumcised or not tell us and so this became a big thing a hot topic and so Paul Barnabas a few others go up to Jerusalem talk to the apostles let's clear this we want to we want to worship God in spirit and in truth we want to do the right thing and so they went there and they realized no we don't need to be circumcised to be saved and so you know they were they were yes teachable but they weren't gullible they weren't just receiving anything that came their way tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine they were humble enough to ask for help when it came to doctrine that they didn't understand and so God make us like that brethren those are just nine points of things that I thought the church in Antioch is is an example to all other churches throughout history and to ourselves so let us examine ourselves as a church and see are those things in us and if so let us let, let us strive so that they are in us even more because it, this is a local church and that's what God has chosen to use through the centuries he's used local churches there's all you know there's some benefit to all those different kinds of institutions seminaries and Bible schools and and uh, charity organizations and all sorts of things okay but when Paul the Apostle and Barnabas were sent out from uh, that church by the Holy Spirit they were not sent out to build schools or institutions or anything else but to plant churches by preaching the gospel people getting saved and they are forming local churches appointing elders in those places that's what God has used through the centuries and if this is a local church and it is then you're in a good position to be used by God no need for big institutions and stuff no they can be helpful but God has used small things like that small church in Antioch to you know do great things and exploits for himself so I think if if uh, if that message in some way is heard by by other evangelical reformed churches in this country that preach the gospel but just that kind of oh that kind of radical generosity you know how many churches just sit on tens and hundreds of thousands of pounds not just in real estate but in in their banks bank accounts just frozen there whilst there's a need not just abroad even here in this land for just work and and things to be done and, and they just sit on it and uh, Lord, I, I prayed Lord let us not be a church that does that just you know just prepares for the rainy day and just kind of faithlessly goes through life and uh, you know there's no point in doing this in this evangelistic effort because God is not in it and and God has stopped working here and God has stopped working there we're in the day of small things and this is this now uh, oh, I've heard all sorts of excuses and I I, I want to be sick when I hear them you know because it's true it, it's born out of faithlessness and out of love of comfort those guys in Antioch they weren't like that they were built different that God gave them just simple faith and maybe they didn't have much and, and they just went out there and, and did things and God blessed those things and uh, I want us to be more like them don't you they didn't, they didn't have political influence they didn't have a big ministry and you know someone from abroad throwing money at them they didn't have that the church in Jerusalem wasn't sponsoring them in fact they went and helped the church in Jerusalem there was no money there involved there was no modern methodologies involved they were simply evangelistically minded mission oriented sacrificially generous and God blessed that and they were taken out of their comfort zone and you know what the, the, the small thing that says that, that, that that's where the disciples were first called Christians that's not because they came up one day and said well you know what let's call ourselves Christians that's what other people called them it was a derogatory term it was something that indicated that they were under some form of persecution there people took notice of them they came up with a name for them and it was a name which was supposed to shame them the world will take notice if God is here and so that's what we want to pray for we want to pray that the Lord would be in our midst that he would use that church and people will take notice even if it means that they call us names okay that's not a big problem 
The bigger problem is if the world out there is indifferent to us and understands us and understands everything we do and they think that we're just another social club. That's the problem. I don't want involvement in such plain church here. You know, that's not what we're here for, are we? Nope. And may God help us. May God help us to have that kind of Antiochian mindset to give sacrificially and, uh, you know, trust God for his promises. Brethren, I, you see, I'm not having a go at you, by the way. I'm actually very thankful that uh, I see many of those things from the church in Antioch. I see them here, and I'm very encouraged by that. So, so but, but, again, let us not rest on our laurels. Let us trust the Lord for more and more and greater exploits. If he has done a little here, he can do more. It is nothing for him, okay? Let us trust him to do more. I have the tendencies in my own heart to love comfort, to want to be at ease in Zion, to not want to sacrifice too much, to want, not want to lose out too much, to not want to put myself in danger or in, 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 a, in a position which might uh, compromise uh, my respectability in society or whatever. I feel that. And I think you feel that. But let us actually trust the Lord in this. And let us be like those Ant Antiochian Christians who were called Christians even when the world was hating them and didn't like what they were, they were, they were up to. Sending mission, sending people, you know, first of all, you come with this Jewish Messiah here and now you think you're going to go into the rest of Asia Minor? I mean, what, you're going to go into Ephesus? Have you not heard of, of Diana, of this goddess? Uh, you know, have you not heard of those? I mean, you'll never be able to expel them from there. Though they are, though those people there are absolutely uh, religious. They, they love their goddesses and gods. You're never going to be able to convince them with this Jewish Messiah thing. And lo and behold, a few years later, there's a church in those places. That's what God does. He uses local churches to plant more local churches until he comes. Father, we pray. Make us just one more piece of this puzzle. Make us one more link in this chain. Use us. We want, to be, we want GFM to be an influential church, just like the church in Antioch. Not in the eyes of the world, but in the grand scheme of things. In the, when, the, when it's all been said and done, that's when we want to, to see the, oh Lord, the fruit that has been birthed through our suffering, our, our giving, our sacrifice, everything. Lord, we pray. Please help us to stay on course till the end. In Jesus' name.